we last lecture on monday i um introduced you to uh, the early life of adolf hitler um his childhood his adolescence teen years um and we looked at um essentially his war history that is going to shape him and is going to shape just the generation of Germans and politicians that um, Hitler is going to be, um, you know, working amongst essentially his generation. Um, his generation is indeed a kind of wartime generation and that World War I experience and the kind of catastrophe that takes place on um, the battlefield is very much going to shape um, Hitler's vision is of the world and as well um, uh, the Nazis and, 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 and Germans overall. Uh, you know, those Germans that um, were not uh, males of military age, um, you know, um, women, children who stayed at home were also shaped by the war. It wasn't just the combat experience, but what happened at home, losing fathers, brothers, sons, relatives in the war, um, starvation in, 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 in Germany, and what's going to happen um, in the early 1920s, as I'll describe in this lecture, also is going to shape that generation of Germans to come. Um, we saw that Hitler had been wounded and was in the hospital when um, the German lines collapsed. Um, I described kind of an internal collapse of, of, of World War I Germany. It wasn't exactly a military defeat on um, the battlefield. Society collapsed within itself and the Second Reich um, the Kaiser monarchy now collapses and, and um, you know, civil war essentially breaks out in, in the streets of Germany. And I described uh, again in last lecture what, what, what that was uh, about. Um, February, you have um, the founding of the Weimar Republic, the Weimar Constitution. Um, I'll again review for you one more time this very important um, clause in the Weimar uh, Constitution, Article 48. Um, Article 48 uh, defines now a new head of state. It used to be as a constitutional monarchy, um, the crown, uh, the Kaiser. Now it's going to be an elected president. Um, it's now a republic. It's no longer a monarchy. President is elected by popular vote for a term of seven years. And it's the president who every time there's an election will appoint um, a chancellor from elected politicians. Um, and um, the chancellor is equivalent to the prime minister. And so the president essentially decides who has the confidence of the German people to form um, a, a, a government. Um, if there is a kind of deadlock in the Reichstag, in, in uh, parliament, the chancellor has the power to proclaim decrees. He can, including suspending constitutional rights or introducing an emergency war measures uh, act or, or decree, all those powers um, the president uh, has, again, if the Reichstag cannot come to some kind of consensus. Um, the only check and balance on that is the Reichstag can overrule a presidential decree by a two-thirds uh, majority, almost similar to the system in the United States where um, the president can veto a congressional bill, uh, but Congress can then override the veto again by a two-thirds majority. So 
Um, the Weimar Constitution is, 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 is structured on that kind of checks um, and balances. And um, finally, and, and this um, is not necessarily part of Article 48, but is part of the Weimar Constitution, um, the seating in the parliament, uh, you know, which party gets how many seats is um, dependent upon essentially how many times they get 60,000 votes. So every time any party gets 60,000 votes, um, they automatically get one seat in, in, in the Reichstag. And, and, and so that's essentially the model um, under which the Nazis uh, will end up eventually seizing power and you're looking at how they do that over the next uh, two lectures. Uh, Friedrich Ebert of the SPD forms the first government. Um, he becomes the first president of, 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 of uh, Germany. And of course, the SPD are essentially the dominant party. Um, if we look at kind of Canadian politics, we could um, look at the SPD as kind of being like the liberal parties. It's a center party but it's liberal, um, you know, to the left of, uh, to the left of the center. Then, you know, I wouldn't exactly, they're almost like the NDP party today, but, but um, you know, it's a center party essentially. Um, I also described to you what happened at the Versailles conference, the Paris Peace Conference, and um, uh, the kind of partitioning of Germany, I described in, in, in detail how Germany and Austro-Hungary are now split apart into uh, these new states. Um, I should also mention that part of the Versailles Treaty also prohibits Germany and Austria from uh, unifying into a single country. Uh, you know, Austria, of course, they're German speaking. Um, and, and, and so there was this immediate fear uh, that Austria and Germany may, may unify. They, they cannot, under the terms of the um, Paris Agreement, the Paris uh, Peace Conference, tr verse, you know, Treaty of Versailles. Um, I also talked about how the German military, of course, was uh, decimated down to 100,000 men max. They cannot have a single man over. And, and I also described to you how all the various um, offensive weapons were taken away from Germany, things like tanks, heavy artillery, and, 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 and so forth. And um, as well, the Air Force is prohibited. Germans cannot have a military air force, nor can they have any kind of um, heavy naval vessels. Um, they can have river patrol boats, um, coastal defense, uh, you know, light warships, but they had to scrap all their, um, you know, uh, cruisers, their battleships, destroyers, all, all that had to be scrapped, essentially. So Germany is left without an air force, without a navy. Um, as so essentially, as I say, it's this utopian uh, notion. Now, one thing remaining, of course, was going to be the question of reparation payments. And that's going to come um, the year after, in 1921, in, in April, the Germans will learn what those reparation payments are going to be. And it's going to have a tremendous effect both on um, Hitler and the Nazi party, and of course, Germany um, as well. Hitler, we saw, uh, is caught up uh, in the kind of civil war. Eventually, um, the German federal government suppresses it. Hitler, once he's released from the hospital, returns back to the German army, where he is sent to infiltrate the Workers' Party. And again, that's where I left off on my lecture last, uh, last Monday. Um, Hitler very quickly begins to rise up 
in um, this very small party. It's, it, it, it really is uh, about 50 people when Hitler joins it. Um, he uh, very quickly gets on the executive and before long, he becomes a dominant figure in that party, uh, partly because of his um, sort of charismatic speech-making talents. He is becoming kind of the face of the party. Um, some party members like Rudolf Hess and Dietrich Erkart um, are, are uh, backing him and sponsoring him. Um, Eckhart begins to introduce Hitler to prominent members of German society for the first time. Um, you know, G Germany, of course, is a very um, class conscious society, uh, you know, with the aristocratic Junker class at the top, the upper middle classes, middle classes, and, and you know, classes did not mix. Often they didn't shake hands even. Um, in, in, in fact, that, that the, the, the so-called Hitler salute, where people hold up, you know, the, their hand and salute, is not actually called um, the Hitler salute. It's, it's called the people's salute. And the point of it was that it was an egalitarian way of Germans to salute each other regardless of their class. Um, that was the notion of the Nazi party, that there are no classes in Germany. It's going to be a classless society. Um, you know, all Germans are equal, um, you know, taking from uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm, 1984. Yes, all Germans are equal, but members of the Nazi party are slightly more equal. Uh, but other than that, the idea of, 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 of that salute was a kind of egalitarian salute replacing a handshake and, and of course working classes uh, would not shake hands with somebody or I should say middle classes would not shake hands with somebody from the working class and upper classes often would not shake hands uh, you know with someone from the middle class. Um, there was a lot of like I said um, heel clicking and bowing and you know, it's, it's, it's an old, as I say, hybrid medieval industrial society and, and um, the Nazis are going to strike out against class consciousness. So Hitler um, begins to grow slowly this, this, this party and for the first year or year and a half, about 18 months, Hitler uh, jointly begins to lead the party with its founder, um, Anton Drexler. And um, eventually Anton Drexler will just resign, stand aside and, 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 and let Hitler take over. And, and I really couldn't even tell you what happened to Anton Drexler um, afterwards. He kind of vanishes from the historical scene or at least from uh, my awareness of him. April, of 1921, um, the Versailles Conference Committee announces that the Germans will have to pay reparations to their former um, enemies, the French, British, Belgian, and Americans primarily. Um, reparations in the amount of 32 to 34 billion US dollars. And, and that's an unheard um, amount in, in, you know, those days. It's just enormous sum of, 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 of money. I know, you know, that's roughly what your tuition is these days. Uh, but back then, um, uh, you know, it's an unbelievable amount of money. That immediately has a huge impact on the value of the Deutschmark. And as, as you can see um, from this chart, um, how much one Deutschmark was worth in US dollars. In 1914, when the First World War begins, the Deutschmark is worth 4.2 US dollars. Um, in other words, one German mark was worth about 25 cents a, a quarter. Uh, by 1918, um, 
it's lost its value a hundred times over. Uh, one Deutschmark is now, uh, sorry, one US dollar now gets you 493 Deutschmarks. That's how cheap they've become um, as Germany collapses at the end of the um, First World War. And, and it kind of slowly began to fall further. But in 1921, in April, when those reparation payments, the amount is announced, uh, the Deutsche Mark in immediately collapses to 18,000 uh, per US dollar. Uh, by July, it's 353,000 Deutschmarks uh, to one US dollar. And by November of 1921, uh, one US dollar gets you 4.2 trillion Deutschmarks. Uh, it's a complete collapse of, of the currency. It's the worst case of inflation we have um, on the historical record. It's, um, it's described essentially as hyper in, in inflation. And of course, it's, it's going to wreak havoc on German society, in particular on the middle classes. Um, the middle classes, many of them manage essentially to survive the war with their assets and, and, and their savings intact, um, this is going to kill that, that off. Um, and, and, and so the German government now is just printing money like, um, uh, you know, like, like, like confetti, essentially. Um, the inflation is occurring so fast that, um, people have to get paid twice a day because by the end of the day, their money is worth less than it was um, in the morning. Uh, as people line up at a store to buy something, um, by the time you get from the back of the line to the front of the line, your money is worth anywhere from 15 to 20 percent less than it was when you started off at the beginning of the line. Uh, what, um, you know, what it costs for you to get dinner in the evening, the next morning, you can't even buy a cup of coffee for the same amount of money. Uh, so, um, you know, people are carrying cash around in these huge baskets, uh, because, you know, a beer costs millions of, 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 of Reichsmarks. Uh, people begin to use paper money to wallpaper their houses because to actually use the bills it costs less than buying wallpaper. Um, the money, you know, you've heard that term, you know, not worth the paper it's printed on. This money, the German Deutschmarks literally are not worth the paper uh, they're printed on. The, the actual value of that piece of paper is more than what it's worth as a monetary uh, amount. Um, bundles of cash are given to kids to play with. Uh, you know, hey, little Fritzy, it's uh, Christmas time. Uh, here's a billion Reichsmarks for you. Um, you know, go play. And, and what, of course, it means is that people begin to meet the bill their bills at the end of the month, people begin selling off all their um, assets, everything they own, uh, let alone their savings. Their savings, of course, are destroyed. And, and so if you had, for example, a pension, uh, you know, and your pension was 600 Reichsmarks, um, say a month, that 600 Reichsmark suddenly is worthless. And, and, and of course, it, the hyperinflation is occurring so fast that nobody can really adjust um, the numbers. So entire households and families are now, if they weren't devastated by the First World War, now they're going to be devastated by this um, hyperinflation. Uh, in, It also saves 
a lot of big corporations uh, because um, and and the government debt system as well. Um, if you had um, corporate loans, let's say you borrowed a million Reichsmarks uh, back during the, the war or the government owed somebody a million Reichsmarks, well, you know, now they just toss you that million Reichsmarks and say, there you go, we've settled our debt. Here's another million interest for you. And essentially that million was worth, uh, you know, 25 cents, but they settled their debt. You know, it's not our fault the Reichsmark is now not worth what it used to be. Uh, and, and, and so middle classes, their savings, working classes and so forth are destroyed um, those who kind of used other people's money and, and you know, that's often the key to wealth, um, upper classes, wealthy classes become that way because they use other people's money, essentially. Um, they borrow, they have the kind of assets on which they can secure loans. And, and, and so um, they walk away scot-free. The money they bor borrowed, the money they owe, is literally worthless. They pay off their debts, and now they're ahead. Um, so it 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 kind of put Germany now on this different path. And, and around um, by 1924, there'll be um, this financial wizard who will return to Halmar Shah. He becomes the uh, president of the Reichsbank, and, and gradually he brings in all these complex measures that, um, uh, plus there's help from abroad that begin to stabilize the German economy. But in the meantime, in those crisis years, um, of course, Hitler is beginning to draw on all these disgruntled Germans now looking for a, a, a some kind of solution um, to the pain that, that they're feeling. Um, on top of that, of course, uh, Germany begins to default on some of its reparation payments. And so as they default on the payments, the French now begin to occupy parts of Germany for the first time. French troops, um, they go into the Ruhr, which is a coal mining uh, district, the Saar, and, and begin to forcibly um, expropriate uh, German coal and other resources under the force of arms. And, and, and so suddenly Germans now, for the first time, are feeling the occupation by their former enemies. And, and the French, of course, are very vindictive considering the state that Germany left France um, during the First World War. Again, remember, um, you know, all the fighting took place in France and in, in, in Belgium. There was no fighting essentially in Germany, and 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 you know the f French farms were destroyed, agriculture, um, uh, you know, and and the French were itching for payback, and now they get it. And, and, and the French, of course, are quite brutal in their occupation of these German provinces. And here you begin to get the first kind of resistance and some of the proto-Nazi martyrs who are um, killed by the French are now going to be raised by the Nazis as, as early Nazi freedom fighters against the French um, occupation. Um, Hitler's Hitler begins to call on um, the Germans to expel the French, to go back to war with the French, you know, because that was the only option essentially Germany had was to say, well, you know, we're not going to sign off on this armistice, we'll just go back to war. Um, and of course, that was no longer a real option, but um, right wing parties, and it's not just Hitler alone, were calling for Germany to scrap the armistice and let's go fight again for a better peace agreement. And, and of course, nobody was ready to go back into that uh, kind of war. Um, so Hitler now forces essentially at the threat of resigning the party by 1921, Hitler forces the party 
to name him as Führer, leader, uh, with um, Führer power, essentially, that um, his word will become law in, in the Nazi party, or else he quits. And on the basis of that ultimatum, the Nazi party votes for that. And, and, and Hitler now becomes uh, the leader of the party and begins to shape it. But there's a lot of challengers inside the Nazi party to Hitler's power. And, and we'll see that those challengers will essentially remain right into about, um, you know, 16 months into when Hitler takes formally power in 1933, in January of 33, 16 months following that, Hitler is still struggling to consolidate his, his power, and he'll have to do that through very ruthless means, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So Hitler's real first and last enemies um, will be his fellow um, Nazi party members. Um, we're going to see that um, the National Socialist Party is going to be kind of divided between this, the kind of more socialist faction uh, on the left and the more nationalist faction on the right, led, led by, by Hitler. Um, Hitler now forms his uh, paramilitary forces, um, these kind of brawlers, stormtroopers. Um, they're known as the SA, uh, the brown shirts. Um, he chooses the color brown uh, by coincidence. Um, part of the Versailles Agreement, Germany is going to lose its colonies in, in Africa. Um, what is Tanzania today, um, Tanganyika prior to being known as Tanzania, um, used to be German West, uh, sorry, German East Africa. Um, Namibia was also a German colony. Um, and, and, and so those colonies are stripped from uh, the Germans. That's how South Africa eventually gets this kind of hold on the Namibia that lasted right into the 2000s. Uh, but what essentially it means is the German army no longer has troops in Africa, and therefore all these brown tropical German army uniforms suddenly hit the surplus market. And so the Nazi party buys up all the German army tropical uniforms and converts them into the Nazi party SA uh, uh, stormtrooper uniform. So that's the origin of, 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 of the brown shirts. And the brown shirts, Hitler models on what Mussolini did. Mussolini, at that point in time, has actually successfully has been seizing power in Italy. And he had these paramilitaries dressed in black shirts. And, and, and um, you know, Mussolini's famous march on Rome, um, the black shirts marching on Rome and essentially intimidating um, the king of Italy to appoint uh, Mussolini as uh, kind of the prime minister of Italy begins uh, Mussolini's dictatorship and, and Hitler um, is going to be a, a huge admirer of Mussolini and, and will be studying very closely what Mussolini is doing in Italy throughout the 1920s and, 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 and 30s and, and taking many lessons from Mussolini's book. So it'll be quite late um, in the 1930s when the roles kind of reverse and Hitler becomes kind of the dominant figure and, and Mussolini becomes um, a kind of a follower almost of, of Hitler, but that's very much later. This is the SA logo. Um, again, you can see um, the S kind of in the form of a rune, the Zig rune or the victory rune, a kind of lightning S. And then in the back, you can see how it's incorporated with the A. SA 
at first SA stood for uh, sports Abteilung, uh, the sports units, uh, because of course Germany was prohibited from having a paramilitary. Um, in fact, I think they restricted even the formation of Boy Scouts in the fear that somehow German Boy Scouts would be militarized. So um, the, at first, the SA is posing as kind of these sports, uniform sports enthusiasts. Uh, you know, we're marching for uh, golf lessons and track and field in these brown uniforms. But eventually, they will become known as the uh, Sturmabteilung, the storm uh, units and and of course these are Hitler's muscle, his fist, his uh, street brawling um, Nazi troopers. So that's um, as I say the paramilitary arm of uh, the Nazi party and by the 1930s uh, there will be millions of them in in, in fact um, the German army by the 1930s, which is still 100,000 men, is going to find itself vastly outnumbered, uh, up to a point of 400 to 1 uh, by um, the SA. So, but again, that's, that's going to come later. But Hitler essentially is building his own private uh, paramilitary. Hitler... Um, he never gets his driving license, so he's chauffeured around, but, but now he's beginning to get financing from the Thule Society. Um, he starts campaigning around Bavaria, essentially. That's, you know, his zone of operation, the southern province of, 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 of Germany. He is essentially an unknown entity in the rest of Germany. He's not yet a national politician. He's a Bavarian politician. And, and again, those 40 German provinces are, are very independent and have their own, you know, almost like Canadian provinces. They have their own legislatures, their own constitutions, like American states as well, their own state police and so forth, all within uh, the German Confederation. So Hitler's primarily focused um, on Bavaria, and, and he immediately recognizes, uh, you know, the value of the automobile for a politician in the same way as he'll be one of the first politicians to realize the value of leasing airplanes on his campaigns. I, I, you know, as far as we know, he's, he's the first politician in history to use um, aircraft uh, to move around during his campaigning, his national campaigning in the 1930s. So Hitler certainly has kind of a vision for technology and its value for his own objectives. That's one thing that does characterize them. Um, Hitler also now renames the German Workers' Party. Uh, it used to be called the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. He now names it um, the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or Nazi for short form. That's where that term Nazi uh, comes from. Uh, formally, uh, the party is known as the NSDAP, um, but you know we've all come to know them as the Nazis. Hitler begins, um, as I say, in um, this party that has roughly um, in 1919, at best, maybe 50 to 500 members. We're not quite sure. Um, they're meeting in these, um, you know, back rooms. Uh, certainly in the first year of the party, um, his leadership brings in about 5,000 party members. So, uh, by 1920, there's 5,000 Nazis, but that's still 55,000 votes short of getting one seat 
in the Reichstag. So um, by 1921, he's going to have now um, 6,000 members. Um, however, members, card-carrying members is one thing. How many people vote is another thing. And, and in 1921, during the summer, um, one of the early Nazi party rallies, um, about 50,000 people attended um, that rally. So he probably by now had at least maybe 120,000 votes. Uh, you know, he could have gotten two seats or three seats in, in, in Parliament. He's beginning to get those um, numbers. Um, once, of course, um, the inflation hits, the numbers now begin to grow. Uh, 1922, 10,000 um, members. Uh, 1923, we got uh, 35,000 members. And by November of 1923, um, there will be 55,000 card carrying party members. And, 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 and so again, um, you know, 55,000 dues paying members, but you know, you got their families, you got their friends, you got people who don't join political parties, but are all ready to vote for the Nazis. And, 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 and so the Nazis are uh, certainly, um, you know, growing in number and, 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 and power by 1923, um, just, you know, deep into the inflation. By 1924, we won't know how many Nazis there are. And by the next year after that, 1925, there'll be half the number, 27,000. Uh, something has gone terribly wrong for the Nazi party. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of a huge collapse in uh, Nazi membership. What has happened? Um, Here, you can see a map of um, Germany in the Weimar era. Uh, Munich is in the south, where Hitler is based. And as I said, he's primarily a politician that's known to Bavarians. He is a Bavarian uh, politician. Um, the Nazi party is essentially founded in Munich. It's a uh, party house. It's party headquarters is, is in Munich. He's got very little understanding of um, in Berlin, of uh, Berlin politics. Um, he's not really a player there. Um, however, um, Hitler now is going to attempt to seize power in Bavaria. He's going to attempt to overthrow the Bavarian government just the way the communists had um, a couple of years earlier where he almost ended up uh, being executed. And, and, and um, Hitler now calls on um, the Bavarian government to attack the French and expel them from territories where the French had, had occupied uh, Germany, the Bavarians, of course, um, you know, will have you know nothing to do with that. Um, Dieter Eckhart, as well, has introduced Hitler to um, all sorts of prominent right-wing figures who, you know, as I say, would not have even shaken the corporal's um, hand. But you know, with uh, members of the Tuli Society essentially mediating these these meetings. Um, Hitler, here, here's one more look at kind of the breakdown. The dark green is Bavaria. So you can see how, how prominent the Bavarian province is. It's about the second largest province with, with Prussia essentially having extended its control throughout most of the German uh, provinces. But Bavaria kind of goes its own way. 
Um, and so now Hitler has met these prominent um, individuals, including Erich Ludendorff, the former chief of staff of the German army in the, in the um, First World War, one of the guys who essentially uh, led the German army into the disaster that the First World War be began for, 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 for Germany. There's Erich Ludendorff um, uh, on the right of the image. And so with this group of right-wing upper-class conspirators, Hitler now brings the Nazi party into a joint conspiracy in November of 1923 to overthrow the Bavarian uh, government in the hope that uh, once the Bavarian government falls to German nationalists, that in all the other regions of Germany, there will be similar revolutions leading to a great national um, revolution. Ludendorff is a prime figure in this. Um, Ludendorff, is important to Hitler because Ludendorff assures Hitler that when the moment comes and they seize power uh, that the German army will come on their side because as Ludendorff likes to say no one would dare to raise their rifle against the field marshal uh, referring to himself the former great field marshal that he thought he was. Um, and, and so Ludendorff assures Hitler that um, he'll be there to keep the German army in hand. You worry about the streets and the SA and, and, and um, the Freikorps, which also are going to be signing on to this little adventure, um, while I'll take care of the German army on our, on our, on our side. They'll come in with us. And so um, November 9th, 1923, um, there's this kind of beer fantasy land, beer cellar, the Brown House, um, the Burger Brau Keller. Um, this is where the beer hall Putsch, Putsch is another German name, is a German name for coup d'etat. Um, you know, the Germans didn't like using French terms, coup d'etat, a, a kind of overthrow of the government from the inside. Um, and, and so the German term for coup d'etat is uh, putsch. And so you get the beer hall putsch. Um, the Bavarian government is holding a meeting in one of the uh, kind of wedding halls, meeting halls in this beer garden fantasy land. You know, there's a hotel there. There's um, all these exhibition halls where people can have a, you know, like a modern hotel with a conference center um, where people can, you know, drink beer and, and hold a convention or a wedding and so forth. And um, the Bavarian government is holding a conference there when Hitler and his SA troopers uh, crash the meeting armed and suddenly take um, the Bavarian cabinet hostage. And, and then they set up roadblocks throughout the city, taking control of, of, of Munich on, on uh, the night of November 8th, November 9th. 1923. And it's not just the Nazis, it's a whole bunch of other uh, factions that um, join in. Here you can see Heinrich Himmler uh, on that day. And, and of course, Heinrich Himmler is, is not a member of the Nazi party at this moment. Um, the flag that um, Himmler is, is, is holding, there he is, is the old German imperial flag. Um, Heinrich Himmler at that moment is a, a, a kind of a, um, 
I would kind of describe the movement he belongs to as Nazi hippies. Um, they're, they're the kind of, um, you know, vegetarian Nazis who want to return back to, um, back to the earth and, and uh, bring back the monarchy at that point. So Himmler is still kind of a, a, a revolutionary monarchist almost. Um, part slash uh, vegan Nazi, uh, as I say, is the best I can describe it. But he's not a member of um, the National Socialist Party. He will eventually, of course, become a member of um, uh, the party. But at that moment, he is. And so there's lots of guys who participated in the Beer Hall Putsch uh, that will later join the Nazi party or just join it um, during the, the, the Putsch, for, you know, kind of forming the early basis of, of the party. Hitler, and I'm simplifying this story, but Hitler essentially leaves Ludendorff in charge of the hostages. And Hitler goes off into the streets, organizing the various roadblocks as they prepare now the next morning. Um, the intention is, is for the revolutionaries now to march on the B Bavarian war ministry. Um, uh, the Bavarians have their own army, kind of a militia army, uh, kind of again like the United States where every state has its own national guard. And, and, and so um, Hitler is planning to march on to the Bavarian National Guard uh, headquarters. Um, and so he leaves Ludendorff that night in charge of the hostages and the hostages start complaining. Um, you know, we're hungry, we're sleepy, we're tired. When, when can we go home? How long are you going to hold us hostage? Uh, you know, and, and remember, this is still like old school politicians who are of the same social class as Ludendorff. They're all upper class politicians. You, you know, you didn't become a politician in Germany, uh, certainly not in, in a ruling party, unless you had that kind of social pedigree. And, 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 and so Ludendorff uh, turns to them and says, well, you know, if you give me your word as uh, former officers and gentlemen, um, that you'll come back, I'll let you go home, have a shower, get some sleep, have breakfast, um, and then you come back as hostages the next morning. Um, and, and, and so they all go, oh, yes, absolutely, we'll give you our word, we'll be back tomorrow morning. Um, and so Ludendorff lets them go home. Uh, and of course, the first thing they do is they get on the phone and, and they call out the cops and they call out the army and, and, and Hitler comes back that night looks at Ludendorff and, and we're the hostages, right? And, and Ludendorff, uh, well, you know, they gave me their word of honor as gentlemen, they'll be back, right? Um, and, and, you know, you, you can just see that Ludendorff's face, just how, uh, you know, kind of the, the doofus looking face. This is the guy who, of course, brought disaster uh, to Germany in the First World War, one of them, um, and is now about to make a disaster of Hitler's um, attempted putsch. The next morning now, Ludendorff, Hitler, and these primary Nazis, they all lock arms and begin marching towards the Bavarian uh, Ministry of War. And um, as they're marching up this Munich street, uh, they can see a line of uh, German na Bavarian National Guard uh, arms lining up. And, and um, Ludendorff again turns to Hitler uh, and, and, and says, you know, no German soldier will dare raise his rifle um, against the field, the great field marshal. And, and about a couple of seconds after Ludendorff says that, the Bavarian army opens fire on uh, the Nazi marchers. The guy standing on one side of Hitler, who Hitler is locked arms with, is shot dead. 
And because Hitler is locked arms with him, he actually drags Hitler down to the ground and may have saved Hitler's life. Hitler actually dislocates his shoulder um, in the fall and, and runs away. He escapes. Um, a number of Nazis are killed. I think 16 Nazis are killed in that uh, volley of fire. And, and of course, uh, the Nazis, these Nazis, 16 martyrs, will become um, the holiest martyrs in, in, in the Nazi cause. Um, in fact, um, Mein Kampf, volume one, it's published in two volumes. Mein Kampf, volume one, um, is dedicated to the martyrs of uh, the October 9th revolution as the Nazis describe it. And don't confuse the October 9th revolution of 1918 with the one of uh, November 9th revolution of uh, failed revolution or Pierre Hall Putsch of 1923. They both uh, occur on the same date by coincidence, but um, just for our purposes, um, the November 9th revolution, if I ever refer to it as, as that, is, is the one in 1918 when the monarchy was brought down. This is the November 9th Beer Hall uh, putsch. Um, one of the nine Nazis, sorry, one of the 16 Nazis falls on a Nazi flag and bleeds out into it. Um, a SA man by the name of Jakob Griminger picks up that banner and keeps marching. And he will now become the permanent guardian of what is the holiest relic in Nazi Germany, the so-called uh, blood banner or the blood banner of the martyrs. Um, and, and here you can see um, Grimminger holding that banner. He uh, will forever be its custodian. Um, including after the war. He, he um, will know where it's um, hidden and he will never reveal it. It's, it's one of the most sought after Nazi artifact, not only by co collectors, but by neo-Nazis um, because of, of the blood in the banner. And, and here you can see um, Hitler kind of holding the banner in his arm, the re in his hand. The reason is, is that all future Nazi banners are consecrated in a ritual, in a blood ritual, where um, somebody from the party, there again, you can see Grimminger holding uh, that banner. Uh, new banners are touched with the blood, are consecrated with the blood of the martyrs um, whenever they're introduced to a, a, a unit or adopted by a unit. So every one of those uh, kind of Roman-like standard banners has actually been, you know, consecrated, or I guess I should do this in the shape of a swastika, uh, consecrated uh, by the blood banner. It's the most, as I say, sacred re relic in, in, in Nazi Germany. And Grimminger is the only one authorized um, as its custodian. Here in this image that I showed you before, um, you can see how all these people, including Hitler, have been drawn to this one thing in the center of the image. Um, it's the banner. Even Hitler salutes the banner. Hitler gives, you know, what we call the Hitler salute, uh, the people salute. Even Hitler salutes the blood banner. The only thing uh, that's um, higher than Hitler in Nazi Germany that even Hitler has to acknowledge is the blood of the 16 martyrs, their sacrifice in 1923. So uh, the banner is last seen around um, 1944, somewhere in there, and, and, and um, it then vanishes and is never seen 
um, afterwards. Uh, Jakob Griminger lives until January of 1969, and he dies never revealing whatever happened to the blood banner. And as I say, it's, it's especially by neo-Nazis, it's thought, uh, you know, because of course, you know, neo-Nazi rituals to have the blood banner and to be able to reconsecrate new neo-Nazi banners and symbols and uh, regalia who is a neo-Nazi's uh, wet dream. So check, check your addicts, see if it's there. Uh, Hitler is arrested. Um, and now Hitler goes on trial. Um, he's charged with a kind of non-capital category of uh, treason, you know, attempting to overthrow uh, the government, but it's not a death penalty um, offense. He, for the first time, he catches the attention of the Berlin press. Hitler uses the trial to make his speeches and, and suddenly his speeches are reproduced in German newspapers nationally. So Hitler certainly is beginning now to get national name recognition for the first time. The judge, after hearing Hitler's speech is, is sympathetic to Hitler. Uh, and, and, and so Hitler is sentenced to five years in prison. Um, he'll serve, um, I guess he'll serve, what, maybe uh, 18 months tops, if I'm not mistaken. He's sentenced in uh, June of um, 19... 23 and, and sorry 1924 not even 18 months eight months uh he'll be released in december of uh 1924 so um he, he'll get very early released um, but in the meantime of course the nazi party is going to be banned uh ludendorff and the other aristocrats they all get um they all uh, get their sentences um, essentially suspended. Uh, so they're released immediately. Hitler is one of the few guys that actually has to go into, into prison. And so here's Hitler, he serves, you know, he's, he's, he gets this very nice cell. I think I've already showed you a picture. Here it is. This is what, you know, Hitler in prison looks like. He's got visitors. He's got his chauffeur, you know, playing music for him. Um, you know, he's got beer and Wiener schnitzel in the cell. He's got tablecloths. And he's writing his book. He's going to write Mein Kampf. Uh, he's going to take the time to write it while he's in, 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 in prison. Uh, and he's got his editor there, Rudolf Hess. In the meantime, the Nazi party is essentially disintegrating. The Nazi party is formally banned. Uh, some of the Nazis will run in the elections that are held while Hitler's in, in, in prison under different party names and affiliations. So officially the Nazi party um, cannot field uh, candidates. But um, Hitler's book, of course, is, is, is uh, going to make him a fortune once it's um, released when he comes out of, out of prison. And then um, it's going to double his fortune once uh, he sees his power. And, and, and of course, the book Mein Kampf will uh, become kind of the Bible in Nazi Germany, you know, um, uh, high school students, you know, when they graduate high school, they get a Mein Kampf uh, high school version, primary school kids get a kiddie version of Mein Kampf. When you get married, you get a wedding edition of Mein Kampf. Um, you know, you check into a hotel, you don't have Gideon's Bible in the drawer. It's going to be a copy of Mein Kampf. Um, and Hitler collects a royalty on every copy. Um, Hitler will actually become very, very wealthy 
um, you know, for example, every time his face appears on a uh, German postage stamp, the German post office pays him a royalty for his image. Um, anytime any official government agency uh, puts up a statue of Hitler, a bust of Hitler, a portrait of Hitler, they have to pay Hitler a, a royalty. Um, and, and so Hitler will have um, these bank accounts around the world. Um, he'll have investments in real estate. He owns all these acres of land in uh, Colorado, for example. Um, so he, he literally is about as rich as uh, Vladimir Putin is today. He, he, he had all those um, hidden cash reserves and many of them have not been uh, discovered. It's essentially, Hitler's property, uh, including Mein Kampf, is seized after the war by the Bavarian government. And, and until Mein Kampf uh, kind of entered into public domain very recently, the Bavarian government held the copyright in, in, in Mein Kampf. And um, the only version that um, the Bavarian government could not control of Mein Kampf was the English language version because Hitler sold the English language rights to Mein Kampf to Hoffman Mifflin, a company in New York. Um, they're, they're still in business. They still have the English rights to Mein Kampf. Um, uh, their textbook publisher, um, you know, some of your textbooks were probably published by Hoffman Mifflin. And, and so they are the only ones who had the English language rights to Mein Kampf. Other languages, the Bavarian government prohibited um, their publication. So, for example, um, early 2000s, the Hungarians attempted to publish Mein Kampf in Hungarian. And um, the Bavarian government sent an army of lawyers to invade Hungary, essentially, and, and just destroyed the publisher in, in copyright lawsuits. Um, and, and, and so there were all these attempts, I say, to ban uh, mein, mein Kampf, right down to already when I was teaching this course, I remember the owner of uh, Indigo Chapters, Harriet Reisman, one day walked into her own stores and, and suddenly saw Mein Kampf on, on, on the bookshelf and said, my God, you know, we're selling a book by Adolf Hitler. And she immediately ba banned Mein Kampf in Indigo. And, and, and of course, the sales in Canada of Mein Kampf suddenly tripled overnight just because she 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 had banned, banned the book. You know, everybody wants a, 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 a banned book. Mein Kampf um, is kind of unreadable, many people say. Um, some argue it's unreadable because the um, English translation is, is, is so bad. So, um, you know, I welcome you to try to give it a read. I, I, I never could get through it um, uh, myself. But it is essentially Hitler's personal biography and his political statement and his um, ideology and, and, you know, as he kind of was shaping it in 1923 when he was writing that, 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 that book. So again, uh, one more time, you know, the traumatic effect of number four, traumatic effect of extreme stress caused by military defeat and economic ruin, the convergence of sociopathic personalities and xenophobic movements, all these things are, are coming to uh, fruition. Um, some key Nazis in um, Hitler's early days, um, Ernst Rome. Ernst Rome is a um, Bavarian infantry officer. Uh, Ernst Rome will eventually become head of the brown shirt stormtroopers. 
Um, he participates. He's a, a, a close associate of Hitler during um, the Bierhau Putsch and uh, during Hitler's seizure of power, of course, Rome will be commanding um, the SA. Rome, probably most infamously, because as you know, um, the Nazis, once they take uh, power, are, are going to be putting uh, gay um, individuals into concentration camps. Um, in fact, um, gay concentration camp uh, inmates will, will uh, have a pink triangle attached to their uniform to indicate that that's their crime, being gay. And yet, as the Nazi party, and, 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 and the Nazi party's, um, I imagine, concern with homosexuality and, and being gay, of course, again, they see it as a crime against uh, the race that, of course, you know, um, male partners cannot, uh, you know, uh, give birth to children. That's a crime against the German race and, and all the other uh, kind of old religious biblical prescriptions, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the morality and the value system uh, kind of um, that, that, that condemns homosexuality. And, and yet, as Rome is partnering with Hitler and, 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 and the Nazis, he is openly and militantly uh, gay. Uh, he, in fact, would describe himself as a um, Spartan gay from uh, that notion of, of Spartan warriors. Uh, according to Rome, uh, warriors should only have sex with other warriors. Um, that a soldier who has sex with a woman um, weakens himself, according to his to that theory. And 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 so Rome kind of celebrates this kind of um, militant, military kind of um, homosexuality that the Nazis, despite their position kind of overlook and until it, call, it came time to get rid of Rome. And, and, and that's, you know, a couple of lectures down the road, what's going to happen to, to, to Rome. But um, it's not a secret. Um, in fact, you can see German cartoons from the era when, when Hitler was rising to power, kind of, um, you know, making fun of these, you know, uh, kind of virile, brawling stormtroopers, um, and 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 yet their core leadership. Uh, there's a kind of a circle of, of of gay SA senior officers that are are leading this uh, rank and 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 file. So um, it's it's an odd little corner of of Nazi Germany that that again we don't quite. Um, understand, but but uh, you know it's you know the kind of hypocrisy that often is typical of movements. You know, um, we need you until we don't need you, and once we don't need you anymore, then then you know something can become a problem. Rome, once um, the beer hall putsch occurs, Rome leaves Germany. He actually joins the Bolivian army in, in um, where he will serve um, as an officer in the Bolivian army. And Hitler will call him back from Bolivia in uh, the late 1920s, early 30s to come and take over the SA, which are beginning to mutiny on Hitler. Again, I'll, I'll get to that. But um, for now, in the early period, Rome is off to Bolivia. Another of um, early members of the Nazi party will be Julius Streicher. Uh, Julius Streicher also comes from Bavaria. I mean, you know, there is a Bavarian Munich clique inside the Nazi party um, among the old fighters that uh, kind of came into being with Hitler. So there is this kind of Bavarian mafia within the um, Nazi party. Um, Streicher also is a uh, Bavarian officer. He is a, a school teacher and um, he forms his own anti-Semitic 
nationalist group, but eventually he becomes so enamored with Hitler that he takes his entire organization and, and puts it under the Nazi party. And, and, and so he's rewarded by Hitler for bringing all these, um, you know, members to the Nazi party. And he'll rise up in German ranks, who will eventually become uh, the Gauleiter in uh, Nuremberg, where the Nuremberg uh, ra party rallies are, 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 are held. Um, Stryker, as a teacher, school teacher will eventually be put by Hitler in charge of um, publishing textbooks for German students. And, and Stryker is not only the publisher of, of textbooks, but he's also the publisher of this um, semi-pornographic uh, anti-Semitic newspaper called Der Sturmer. Uh, it's a weekly paper. It um, eventually will have a, a circulation of something like a weekly circulation of 700,000 issues a week. Excuse me. And you remember those early comments that Hitler made about the Viennese anti Semitic press. Hitler felt the same thing about Der Sturmer, as did a lot of Nazi party members close to Hitler. They thought Der Sturmer was an embarrassing, um, you know, was like, like, like um, uh, you know, the National Enquirer, like an anti-Semitic version of the National In Enquirer. And a lot of senior Nazi uh, officials were embarrassed uh, by Der Sturmer, not only at home in Germany, but even abroad. Right, um, but their Sturmer basically had uh, common themes, you know, Jews as Christ killers, um, the Jews as seducers of uh, children. This, in fact, you're looking at um, images of Jews as portrayed in children's textbooks that Stryker would publish for um, the public school system in, 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 in Germany. Here you can see, um, you know, the Jewish child molester, um, the D Jewish pimp accosting women arriving in Berlin from the countryside um, at the train station and, and trying to lure them into prostitution. Um, the Jewish doctor who's molesting the pure German female patient. Um, the Jewish businessman who's seducing the young uh, pure German maiden. Um, this also, here's an example of how uh, Stryker's textbooks would um, delineate for kids the difference, you know, how do you tell the difference between a Jew and, and a German? Well, you know, the German has these kinds of um, Greco-Roman uh, perfect classical features. He's a hard worker, um, you know, shoveling and digging ditches and roads. Uh, but um, the Jew on the right, um, uh, you know, is overweight, he's unhealthy, he's smoking German because the Nazi party led a war on cancer and smoking. Uh, you know, the, the Hitler as much, you know, he was a vegetarian for health reasons, not for ethical reasons. He also hated smoking and, and uh, he was very much discouraged in in the Third Reich, um, but um, essentially, it's serious, you know these textbooks would set up stereotypes uh, for kids. Stryker, Stryker eventually will become a problem for the Nazis. So by the 1940s, he's even fired as a Gauleiter. And, and, and so Stryker, by the end of the war, is only a publisher of Der Sturmer. He's basically uh, put aside by the Nazis. And of course, at the end of the war, he is arrested by the Allies. And um, he is tried. He's one of the 20 defendants at Nuremberg. Um, he's one of the few defendants who um, 
basically says, you know, I'm proud of what we did. Uh, as far as the Jews are concerned, we didn't kill enough of them. Um, is Stryker's position. He goes to the gallows. The, his last words is, I'm being killed by a Jewish conspiracy. Um, he was, as I say, he was pretty paranoid and, and kooky. Here you can see his Bible that he had with him in the cell. And, and, and he's been kind of underlining, uh, you know, these kind of various psychosexual terms that he finds in the Bible. Um, you know, he's uh, indicating, you know, where there's descriptions of incest, pimping in the Bible, um, blood, race, pig. These are his his notes in the margin of his deception of the fathers, the slave trade. So he just goes to work uh, on, 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 on the, the Bible. But as I say, Streicher will be um, executed. Okay, uh, let me give you a five minute break if uh, you need to grab a glass of water or coffee or something. And um, for those of you who don't, I can maybe answer some uh, questions if there are any. Uh, Professor Vronsky. Yes. Um, so for the essay proposal, do we also submit it through D2L or do we just email it? No, you're just going to email it to me. Okay, thank you. Just make sure you're right into subject line, CHSD 603 assignment one. It'll just make it easier for me to handle all the files. So you're, you're going to be emailing that to me before um, 11.59 Friday or by 11.59 PM Friday. Professor, I also have a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if it would be okay if I did my paper, I think, I hope I say her name properly, on um, Irma Grassi, the uh, Beast of Belson is like what she was known supposedly. Irma Grise. Yes, see, yes. Obviously I did not say her name right, so I will yes. get that. But um, is that okay? Is she like lesser known enough? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, amazing. Yeah, abs uh, absolutely. Great, thank you. I have a question about uh, sources. About? Sources. Sources, yes. So I found a lot of um, books and articles on Jews that were part of Auschwitz and their stories like within it. So I wanted to use some of those as my reference. I know it's kind of biased because it's them talking about their experiences. Right. Um, can I use some? Like uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and 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 you're right. Um, certainly, survivor testimony, witness testimony, um, has to be, you know, handled kind of delicately, um, because in indeed people don't always remember things, um, you know, factually. Often. Um, uh, you know, some witnesses, uh, you know, they lose their families, they uh, lose their, their, their past lives, and, and, and often they feel that somehow it's, you know, what happened to them is kind of insignificant. Um, I don't know why people feel that, but they do. And, and, and so often they put themselves in places that they never were, um, you know, significant historical um, events, say, for example. So all, all that you have to deal with, with carefully, but sometimes there's no way of, of ever knowing uh, unless you get into their, you know, personal archives. Um, you know, there, there's also, there are some, like, almost fraudulent um, books. There aren't many, but, but there's one in particular that I find troubling, 
um, it, it, and, and, and the only people who challenged it, unfortunately, are kind of like Holocaust deniers. And, and, and so the challenge is kind of for the wrong reasons, but that's an account um, by a doctor who worked for um, Joseph Mengele, uh, a guy called Nietzsche. It's a very famous book, um, you know, doctor at Auschwitz and, 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 and so forth. Um, I looked actually into the primary source material and the guy did exist, except um, he was in a different part of Auschwitz than the way he describes what he describes in the book. And, and, and there's questions even whether he wrote that book or somebody actually wrote it under his name. But it, that book is still for sale. It's still on uh, reading lists and, 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 and so forth. It's, it's part of curriculums. And, and even though a lot of the material in the book is factually correct, um, and is based, I think, on testimony given in the trials and so forth. I suspect that the Dr. Nietzsche, Mikolaj Nietzsche, who is credited with writing the book, actually did not write that book. Um, you know, somebody in his place wrote it. So, um, you know, it alleges, purports to be his personal eyewitnesses, eyewitnessing these events. I don't, I don't think that he personally witnessed them, but it, it, it's accurate in terms of, you know, the facts more or less as, as they're given, but, but these are not the way Neatsley came to learn them. So, so okay. the, you know, that's an issue in all types of, of history, but it's particularly, you know, with the problem, as I say, of Holocaust denial, it's particularly a thorny, um, uh, a thorny issue because this isn't, you know, Holocaust denial isn't just a que question of, um, you know, discussing factual history. It's a question of, of course, what does all that mean, right? right. When a Holocaust denier says, you know, there were no quote homicidal gas chambers at Auschwitz, therefore, therefore, it's the therefore that becomes the problem. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. why are they claiming this? So it's not a question of just free historical uh, debate. And, 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 and so it becomes prob problematic for the rest of us, uh, you know, who are studying the Third Reich. And, and we come across this kind of major work that turns out to be you know, fraudulent. Uh, you begin to sound like a Holocaust denier if, if, if you actually question um, the validity of a particular work, especially if it's accepted by so many institutions. I mean, um, right. you know, that's one book that really I find trouble. With. Okay. Um, and to combat that bias, would it be a good idea to maybe use like defense transcripts from the trials? Um, yeah, but you know, People testify to all sorts of things too. So uh, okay. you know, trials are very biased, right? right. Uh, you know, especially the Nuremberg trials. Let's not kid ourselves that the Nuremberg trials were about justice. Right? Yeah. The Nuremberg trials are a very political trial, um, and and you know there was a purpose uh, to them. So um, you know, I'm not saying the Nazis didn't deserve what they got at the end of that trial. Uh, but to say that that trial met the standards of justice as we understand it in the Western, in the Western world, the way we practice law, um, you know, in Europe, in North America, and, and, and so forth, um, you know, genocide was not a crime when the Nazis committed it. And, and so in Western practice, uh, if something is not a crime, when you do that, you can't be charged with it. It's only after it's passed as a law and defined as criminal that uh, somebody can get charged with, with doing it after it's become a law. But prior to that, it's not a crime. And yet, um, they were tried for, for, for genocide. And, and, right. and that was the first objection the Nazis' defense um, had, you know, that this really shouldn't be under Western, under kind of the Roman judicial process that we accept, you know, Justinian's principles of, of, of law, you know, you can't be charged for the same crime twice, 
uh, right? Uh, you can only go on trial once. You can't, they can't just, you know, if you're acquitted, they just can, can't rearrest you for right. that same crime. The same thing, you cannot be a, arrested for doing something that wasn't a crime when you did it. But we did it at Nuremberg. So, okay. you know, you never see the people who won the war in a war crimes doc. It's, 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 it's something that is reserved for the losers. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions before I go on? All right. Um, while Hitler is in um, prison, he essentially almost resigns himself from dealing with party issues, you know, when there is conflicts inside the Nazi party, uh, while Hitler's in prison, they kind of go visit him in the prison cell, uh, you know, tell us what the right decision is. And eventually Hitler says, stop coming to me. Um, I can't be doing this in prison. And, and so the guy who kind of attempts to take Hitler's place while Hitler is serving his sentence is um, Alfred Rosenberg. And, and I've already mentioned Alfred Rosenberg um, in an earlier lecture as the guy who gives us that uh, term, you know, Bluten, Bowden, uh, blood and, 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 and soil. And he is going to be a key ideologist in the Nazi party through the 1930s. Um, eventually, he's going to lose favor and position in the Nazi party, but um, in the 1920s and 30s, he's often seen as Hitler's ideologist, his theorist. Um, he, as I say, will end up at Nuremberg after the war. Um, here, again, you can see Rosenberg with the blood banner, um, because he was at the Beer Hall Putsch as, as well, and the gold uh, party badge that I had uh, described given to the first 100,000 members of the Nazi uh, party. So he's a senior member of, 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 of the party. Um, Rosenberg is born in um, the Baltic states in Estonia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, um, they uh, have large ethnic German populations. So even though he lives in the Russian Empire and is a uh, subject of the Russian king at, at, at birth and uh, speaks Russian, is educated in um, the imperial Russian educational system, his ethnicity is, 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 remains German. Um, he is an architectural student at the University of Moscow when the Russian Revolution breaks out. And it's a little cloudy exactly what Rosenberg's role might have been during the Russian Revolution, whether he was a Bolshevik or, or, or not. But Rosenberg will arrive in Germany after the Russian Revolution, uh, asking for German uh, citizenship. In fact, he'll show up in Dieter Eckert's and Rudolf Hess's office, uh, asking to be admitted into the Tumi Society, and he will present himself as an um, anti-Semite. And um, he'll describe this story, how when in Moscow, during the street fighting of the Russian Revolution, he is uh, working on his school, his university studies in, in the dormitory. Um, there's no electricity, he's working by candlelight. And he says, a mysterious figure from the dark enters um, his room and without saying a word, lays down on his desk a, a small pamphlet. Um, and, and he brings this pamphlet to Dietrich Eckhart and to Rudolf Hess and the Thule Society. He brings this pamphlet uh, from Russia. This is the pamphlet. 
uh, Sionistia Protocoli, uh, or as, as we know them in English, um, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of, of Zion. This is a anti-Semitic forgery created by the Russian secret police um, around 1905 during the first failed Russian revolution. Um, this occurs when the Russians had just fought the Japanese in the 1905 war with Japan and the Japanese essentially destroyed two Russian fleets humiliated the Russian government. Um, you know, the Russians were very embarrassed. Uh, you know, they were the first kind of great European power to suddenly be beaten uh, by a, you know, non-white, non-Christian uh, power, the Japanese. It, it uh, brings Japan into the fold of great powers, and, and of the great powers of that era are, are, are um, you know, France, Germany, the United States, uh, Britain, Italy, um, and Austro-Hungary, uh, right? And, and, and Japan is the only non-Christian uh, country that achieves the status of uh, great power. And, 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 and so it's just the whole defeat of, of, of Russia uh, partly due to imperial incompetence, triggers this massive popular revolution. And so um, the Russian secret police now manufactures this, this pamphlet that alleges it was a Jewish conspiracy that essentially led to the fall of um, the Russian war effort against Japan. You know, the usual story, blame it on the Jews. Right. And um, the uh, protocols of um, the learned elders of Zion purports to be secret documents that Zionists had created for a Zionist conference that they had accidentally left on the train. And in it, um, there are plans for the takeover of uh, the world, of the banks, the newspapers by the Zionist Jewish conspiracy. And, and, and it becomes this kind of um, a tool for anti-Semites around the world to this uh, day. And, and so in 1919, it's now uh, translated into German and introduced into German society. It'll be translated into English. Um, by 1920s, we realize that it's a forgery because it's based on another pamphlet that was published in France uh, by Maurice Joly. Um, uh, the pamphlet, pamphlet was called um, uh, Dialogues in Hell. Um, it's word for word almost exactly the same as the Protocols of Zion. However, um, it's not in, in the Jolie pamphlet, the French pamphlet, it's not the Jews that are conspiring, but it's French bureaucrats. Uh, the Jolie pamphlet is, is kind of a satire, um, but somebody in the Russian secret police got their hands on the Jolie pamphlet. They didn't have a very good imagination. And so every time they saw the word, you know, French bureaucrat, they substituted the word Jew for it. And thus you get the birth of the protocols of the elders of Zion. And, and now through the 1920s and 30s, it starts getting translated into all these uh, languages abroad. Portuguese, Spanish, French, uh, in the United States, Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company, who of course is, uh, Henry Ford was a, was a notorious anti-Semite. He sponsors its publication in the United States. And um, as well, of course, Ford publishes an anti-Semitic newspaper in Detroit, the Dearborn Independent. Ford, um, you know, is, as I say, notorious anti-Semite. Uh, he is 
pro not only anti-Semite, but he's pro-Nazi. In fact, the Nazis will give Henry Ford the highest medal a non-German can receive um, on the eve of the war in the 1930s, the Order of Germany, uh, the or sorry, the Order of the Eagle. Uh, this is a you know again for Henry Ford's work in Germany. Um, Henry Ford, of course, the Ford Motor Company will be producing a lot of German military vehicles right through the war, um, even as the United States goes to war with, with Germany. So Ford um, is very highly regarded by uh, the Nazis. And, and indeed, when in the 1930s, when Ford attempts to do with labor unions in um, Detroit, what the Nazis did with German labor unions, um, a lot of people, labor union activists will draw uh, those parallels between um, Ford's admiration for the Nazis um, and, and what he was attempting to do in, 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 in Detroit. Um, the book is still sold. Um, essentially, if you ever get into an argument with a kind of a Holocaust denier or a neo-Nazi anti-Semite, um, eventually it's going to come to the Protocols of Zion, you know, um, because if, if you challenge a, you know, anti-Semite on some of the premises of, you know, the Jewish conspiracy, for example, um, you know, Wall Street banking is all controlled by Jews, right? Um, you know, Wall Street banking was all con controlled by Protestants, not Jews, right? So, you know, find me one Jew on the board of directors of a, of a, of a bank in New York in the 1930s, 40s, or even 1950s, uh, or a major Wall Street firm, uh, good luck, you know, and, 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 and so when you begin to kind of challenge them on kind of that kind of um, a factual basis, they'll come back to you, well, it's all in the Protocols of Zion, uh, you can just read it there, there's your evidence, and, and, and of course, the response would be, well, you know, um, we've known since the 1920s that the Protocol of Zion you know, are, 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 are a false. And, and of course they say, well, that's the Jewish conspiracy, uh, that it's false. It's, it's Jewish newspapers that declare them false. They're real. No, they're fake. No, they're real. No, they're fake. And, and, and so you enter into that circular argument and there's nowhere to go. It ends with the protocols of, 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 of Zion. Um, and even Hitler admitted uh, that the Protocols of Zion are probably a, for a forgery, he said. Um, however, Hitler says, well, you know, even if the Protocols of Zion are, are, are forgery, they actually reflect the reality of um, what occurred. Uh, kind of in the same way, just 10 minutes ago, I said to you, well, you know, the Neatsley book maybe is a forgery, but it actually reflects uh, the reality of what happened at Auschwitz. Um, uh, you know, uh, neither my argument nor Hitler's argument is a very good excuse for either Neatsley's book or for um, the Protocols of Zion. But they're sold everywhere to this day. There's all these new editions constantly for sale. If you ever travel in the Middle East, you know, in a place like, you know, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and so forth, Protocols of Zion um, in Islamic countries are, are, are just sold, you know, wherever you buy magazines or tobacco. Um, Here's a copy somebody sent me from the airport bookstore uh, in Indonesia, um, the international airport at Kuala Lumpur. Uh, there it is, uh, World Conquest Through Jewish Government, which is another title. So often it's, 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 it's uh, published under various kind of titles. And again, World Conquest Through Jewish, uh, World Jewish Government is an example of yet another repackaging of the Protocols of Zion. Um, right down to, um, you know, 9-11. Uh, this is a, a kind of film by uh, Mark Levine that he called Protocols of Zion. Um, did you hear that no Jews died on 9-11? Um, yet another conspiracy theory 
um, that you know the world Jewish conspiracy telephoned every Jew who worked in the World Trade Center the night before um, and told them not to go to work the next day. Uh, therefore, no Jews died in 9-11, uh, is, is that argument. So, uh, you know, the Protocols of Zion is something that, of course, for the Nazis will become a license to kill. Uh, because, you know, according to the Protocols of Zion, the Jews want to destroy us. So um, that's our excuse for killing them. We're killing them in self-defense uh, will be the argument that the Nazis are... are, are going to promote Protocols of Zion will be instrumental in that. And, and of course, Rosenberg is the guy who gives us that gift. Um, he's the one who kind of brings it out of Russia into Germany. And then from Germany, it, it, it spreads like a virus that is still um, infecting people today. Um, Rosenberg will also author the second best-selling political testament in Germany, uh, kind of a companion book to Mein Kampf, um, called The Myth of the 20th Century. Um, and in it, Rosenberg introduces that concept of a, a racial ecology, um, you, know, you, know, you know, blood and soil. Um, it's um, a book that Hitler himself kind of um, rejects in, in many ways. In many ways, Hitler, um, you know, doesn't want this to be a kind of a um, rival version of Nazism. Um, Hitler himself often will reject a lot of the occult and supernatural and uh, kind of mythical aspects of uh, Nazism, the way they're adopted by Rosenberg and, and, and Himmler. But, um, you know, he kind of says, well, if you guys want to believe it, that's fine. But it's not, I just want to, rem you know, remind everybody that's not the official um, policy of, 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 of the Nazi Germany. Um, but in um, the myth of the 20th century, essentially what Rosenberg um, says, he says that, um, first of all, he says that um, Western civilization has two basic philosophical foundations. Um, one is the Hellenic Germanic, Hellenic Greek, right? Um, so a kind of Greek classic Germanic tradition. Um, the other is the parasitic Judaic. Uh, so that's the only two flavors you have for Western civilization, according to Rosenberg. You're, you're, you're either kind of a Hellenic uh, German or you're a parasitic Jew according to Rosenberg. Um, he will write that a, a nation is constituted by the definite character formed by its blood, as well as by language, geographical environment, and the sense of a united political destiny. But the decisive element is always the blood. Great poets and heroes testified to the eternal value of special blood soil, Rosenberg says. Um, he says that every race has its own soul, um, and, and that soul simply means race from the interior, and inversely, race is the external aspect of soul. Rosenberg writes that race is the head of a hierarchy of values that embrace the state, art, and religion. And so Rosenberg now proclaims and calls for the abolition of the Old Testament, the first um, half of the Bible, kind of the, the pre-Christian part of the Bible. He says, he says, today, a new faith is awakening, the myth of the blood, the belief that the divine being of mankind generally is to be defended with the blood. The faith 
embodied by the fullest realization that the Nordic blood constitutes that mystery which supplanted and surrendered the old sacraments. And of course, the old sacraments, he's referring to Christianity. Um, he says that um, the blood that perished is coming to life again in its mystical sign, the swastika, the soul of the German people renewing its life cells, past and present suddenly appear in a new light. And for the future, there is a new mission. The meaning of history and the tasks of the future no longer lie in the fight of one class against the other, or of one church dogma against another, but in the settlement between blood and blood, race against race, nation against nation. So, you know, Rosenberg essentially is making a declaration of race war, that future wars will no longer be about revolutionary class struggles of the kind that had just occurred in the Soviet Union, or they're not going to be wars between monarchies or like the 30-year war, um, a war between religions. We're coming to an era of race war. And, and that's exactly what Nazi Germany is going to pursue on the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front is going to be a, 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 a racial, brutal, um, racial war. So, um, you know, like I said, Hitler didn't particularly like um, uh, that book, and uh, Hitler himself will say, um, I must insist that Rosenberg's myth of the 20th century is not to be regarded as an expression of the official doctrine of the party. I myself merely glanced cursorily at it. In any case, it is written um, in too much of an incomprehensible style, in my own opinion. You know, Praises from Caesar, that's, that's coming from the guy who authored the incomprehensible Mein, mein, mein Kampf. Um, and nonetheless, as I say, Rosenberg through the 1920s and 1930s will be regarded as the ideologue of the Nazi party. He will slowly lose favor um, with Hitler. Um, he will be in 1941, he will be appointed as um, the Reich's minister for occupied Russia, for the Eastern territories. Um, but despite this kind of high ranking appointment, he will have virtually no power in occupied Russia. Uh, Heinrich Himmler of the SS will actually have the real power, even though nominally um, Heinrich Himmler is supposed to report to Rosenberg about anything the SS is going to do inside of Russia under the German occupation, but that's not going to be the case. Um, and, and, and again, when we look at this st structure of power in Nazi Germany, we'll see that this is, for example, an example of what we call chaotic pol uh, polycracy, where, where you have multiple structures of, 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 of power um, uh, that, that are chaotic in their nature, a, a, a kind of Darwinian dog-eat-dog. -dog. Um, whoever survives is the one who's going to rise to the top. And, and Rosenberg will not fare well inside of Nazi Germany. Um, uh, you know, by, by 1943, 1944, he's a complete joke. Um, but of course, it, it, it doesn't stop from him being tried for all the ideological contributions that he had made uh, to Nazi Germany. And, and he will for his writings and for the things that even though he didn't have power as the governor of Russia, he signed off and he'll be hung at Nuremberg for that. So again, he's one of the 20 defendants at, at, at Nuremberg. You can read about his crimes if you go to the Nuremberg uh, trial, uh, trial documents. So 
while Hitler is in, 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 in prison, the Nazi party essentially begins to fall apart. Um, Bavaria bans the Nazi party as do other provinces. Um, the Nazi party newspaper, which Dieter Eckhardt had, had at first edited, and then once Dieter, Dieter Eckhardt uh, passes away, Rosenberg becomes the editor of the Nazi uh, newspaper. It's known as the uh, Folkische uh, Beobachter. Um, a Tully society will finance the purchase of that newspaper uh, by the Nazi party. It will become the Nazi party's official paper. It also is banned during this, 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 this period. As I say, Rome leaves for uh, Bolivia. And, and so the Nazi party is, is coming apart. Um, there is a faction, a rival faction inside the Nazi party that has always been suspicious of um, Hitler. Um, and this is a faction led by um, the Strasser brothers. And, and I'll get to the Strasser brothers in, 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 in a second. Regardless, um, come uh, the end of 1923, I think December, if I'm not mistaken, let me just get you the exact date here. I always forget if it's 1923 or 1924. We're actually December 20th, 1924. Um, Hitler is released after serving, as I say, roughly um, eight months of his sentence. That's actually a photograph of Hitler on the day he's uh, released from prison. Two weeks after Hitler is released, he now meets with the Bavarian Prime Minister, Dr. Heinrich Held, um, who Hitler had attempted to overthrow. And Hitler now promises Heinrich Held that he will, from now on, respect the German constitution, um, that he will never attempt to take power outside of the constitutional electoral um, process. And um, Heiner Held will say the beast has been tamed. Um, and, 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 you know, Hitler will actually, that's one promise Hitler will hold to. When Hitler in 33 takes power, it'll be entirely uh, through the electoral constitutional uh, process or almost entirely, pretty much the way Hitler gave, gave his word, although he's gonna use a whole bunch of loopholes um, that are available in, the, in, in that constitution. Here he is, uh, the beast uh, tamed. Um, and, and so as a result of Hitler's proclamation that he'll now respect the German constitution, the ban on the Nazi party is now lifted. And um, the Bellbachter now uh, goes back into publication. And there's problems inside the Nazi party suddenly. A lot of hardcore revolutionary Nazis, particularly those on the left wing of the Nazi party, like the Strasser brothers, begin to feel that Hitler has sold out, that the Nazi movement was a revolutionary movement, and Hitler is now selling out to kind of middle class political uh, values. That Hitler wants to make the Nazi party just like any other political party. Um, and this is what we're struggling against, is, 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 you know, the argument. Hitler, in the meantime, is beginning to practice his speech-making um, styles. And, 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 and here you can see a series of photographs that Hitler had taken of himself, his, his um, 
personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, takes the pictures so that Hitler can study the various gestures he makes during his speeches. Um, you know, kind of like a, a golfer studying videotapes of his swing or a baseball player uh, looking at, you know, videotapes of, of, of his swing and so, so forth. And um, Hitler wanted these photographs destroyed, but Hoffman thought they were so important. So um, I, I usually at this point in lecture kind of run um, a, a, a video of... Um, Hitler's speech making. Let's see if I can make this worth. Hang on, uh, hang on a second. His public appearances were carefully staged managed. Nothing was left to chance from the size and timing of the rally to the ritual surrounding his entrance. He would keep the crowd waiting before the speech began, deliberately raising the tension to fever pitch. A fumbling hesitancy marks the beginning. A mass rally, said Hitler, is designed to switch off the thinking process. Only then would the people be ready to accept the magical simplifications before which all resistance crumbles. His attack always followed the same pattern. The Kampf gegen den Marxismus wurde damals zum ersten Mal zu einem Kampfziel erhoben. Damals gelobt ich mir zum ersten Mal als unbekannter Eiserer diesen Krieg zu beginnen und mich zu ruhen, bis endlich diese Erscheinung aus dem deutschen Leben beseitigt sein würde. He would bemoan the loss of national self-confidence and pride. Hat dann unser Volk noch erdulden müssen, die Millionen Menschen um ihre Spargroschen beraubte, alles, alles angestiftet und alles gemacht und alles verantwortet von den Männern des November 1918. Wir wollen nicht liegen und wollen nicht schwinden. Ich habe es. Deutschland! 
dann nicht das Schild da hinten, sondern selbst den schaffen mussten. Von der Liebe zu diesem einen Volk und hänge felsenfest die Überzeugung, dass eben doch dann einmal die Stunde kommt, in der die Millionen, die uns heute verfluchen, hinter uns stehen und mit uns begrüßen werden dann das gemeinsam geschaffene, wieder erkämpfte, wieder erworbene, neue deutsche Reich der Größe und der Ehre und der Kraft und der Herrlichkeit und der Gerechtigkeit. Amen. Wir sind intolerant. Ich habe mir ein Ziel gestellt, nämlich die 30 Parteien aus Deutschland hinauszufegen. Sie verwechseln nicht immer mit einem bürgerlichen oder einem marxistischen Politiker, der heute SPD ist und morgen USPD und übermorgen KPD und dann Syndikalist oder heute Demokrat und morgen Deutsche Volkspartei und dann der Wirtschaftspartei. Sie verwechseln uns mit ihresgleichen selbst. Wir haben ein Ziel uns gewählt und war festeres Banates, rücksichtslos, bis ins Grab hinein. Das Deutsche Volk ist nicht mehr das Volk der Ehrlosigkeit, der Schande, der Selbstzerfleischung, der Gleichmütigkeit und Kleinkleinigkeit. Nein, Herr, das deutsche Volk ist wieder stark geworden in seinem Geiste, stark in seinem Willen, stark in seiner Beharrlichkeit, stark in der Tran aller Opfer. Herr, wir lassen nicht von dir nur Segen unseren Kampf um unsere Freiheit und damit um unser deutscher Volk und Vaterland. Am 30. Januar sind in Deutschland die Würfel gefallen. Und ich glaube nicht, dass die Gegner, die damals noch dann heute auch noch lachen, vollzieht sich in Deutschland, die sich von all den ähnlichen früheren Vorgängen solcher Art unterscheidet durch die unerhörte Disziplin und Planmäßigkeit ihrer Durchführung. Denn das Heer der Waffenträger der Nation ist dann müsst ihr sein, der Willensträger, der politisch gestaltende Willensträger der deutschen Nation. Es alles ist halt. Da möchte ich euch jetzt danken, dass ihr nicht wankend geworden seid, dass ihr mich in der Zeit nicht verlassen habt. Denn nur euch allein ist etwas ja alles zuzuschreiben. Wenn ihr damals gegangen wärt, niemals wäre Deutschland mehr gerettet worden. Ihr habt das Recht, euch heute durch euren Mut und eure Beharrlichkeit als des Volkes und Vaterlandes retten zu wollen. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen machen. Auch das unterfällt nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit zugrunde geht. In unseren Augen, da muss der deutsche Junge der Zukunft schlank und rank sein, flink wie Windhunde, zäh wie Leer und hart wie Kruppstahl. Guys, hear it this time? Yeah, we heard it. It was nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, really. really. Good. All right. So that good. gives you a little taste of um, 
the best hits of Hitler. Uh, you know, you can see kind of the rhythm that he has and often documentary films kind of exaggerate, um, you know, the most dramatic aspects of, uh, or, or the harshest aspects of his presentations. But um, if you look at a speech of his over the span of minutes or, or you know, 15 minutes, an hour, um, you get a better sense of, of, of why this kind of ridiculous chaplain-esque, horse sounding creature was, um, you know, so appealing to so many uh, Germans, not only in kind of the way he made his delivery, but in the kind of things he, um, you know, he was saying, um, you know, from that little clip where, he describes that's, you know, in the 1920s, where he's saying, you know, there are all these other political parties. Uh, he essentially tells everybody he's going to get rid of them all. Uh, so it's not like it's a surprise. Um, and you got to remember that people will be voting for Hitler and he will have significant electoral returns. Essentially, Hitler will, will be elected into a position from which he will then seize um, final powers. So, um, you know, by the content of what he's saying, the kind of restoration of pride to Germans, the kind of new discipline of young Germans, you know, he describes them that, you know, they'll be as swift as, as uh, greyhounds and as hard as, um, it doesn't come out in the translation, but he actually says they'll be as hard as Krupp steel. And Krupp was, you know, one of the companies producing um, artillery and, and, and battleships. So he says, you know, kids will be as, as fast as greyhounds and as hard as Krupp steel. Professor? Yeah. I had a question regarding the video. Yes. In the video, he mentions, like, asking for, like, a blessing from, like, the Lord. And yeah. technically, they do, like, denounce faith. So what does that, like, really mean then? Like, yeah, what, still believe what, you in know, a higher what, being? you know, like what Lord, um, uh, yeah. you know, is it a Christian God? Is it a, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of other higher power, uh, right? Um, and, you know, politicians are, are often will, will speak in the name of God when they um, are in fact atheists. Uh, so, they, so it's not a, a, a surprise. Um, you know, certainly he doesn't bring up Christ. Uh, you know, it's, so it could be like the God of war, it could be a kind of pagan notion of, of, um, of a, of a uh, you know, power in nature, the environment. I mean, you know, uh, essentially paganism believes that everything has a Holy Spirit, essentially. So, um, Hitler never really articulated his religious beliefs. He kind of left them vague. He knew how important Christianity was for Germans. So he didn't exactly, um, you know, seek to suppress it. He discouraged it. Uh, but he, you know, used God in his uh, speeches, in his proclamations. Um, which God? That is up for us to interpret. You know, Abraham Lincoln was an atheist. And, and yet you look at Abraham Lincoln's speeches, um, you know, there's constant references uh, to God. So, um, you know, when politicians, especially in the ones who are elected, um, uh, you know, speak of God, you often have to take that with a grain of salt too. And, and, and sometimes, you know, question them closely on exactly what God they they mean. Any other okay. questions just about the Hitler speaking style or anything? All right, so um, Hitler now, as he emerges um, out of prison, um, he is now going to, on February 27th, 1925, he's going to announce the refounding of the new NSDAP, the new Nazi party. Um, in the meantime, uh, Frederick Ebert, the first president of Germany, 
dies. And, 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 and so Germans now have to elect a new president. And uh, what do you know? Uh, Paul von Hindenburg, the other uh, three guy of the three guys who led uh, you know, Germany into the disaster of World War uh, I, is elected as president of Germany for the next uh, seven years. And, and, and of course, Hitler's future now as a politician is going to be tied to winning or attempting to win the approval of President Hindenburg after an election as Hitler is going to attempt to get himself appointed as a uh, chancellor and to, to form a government. It's, it's going to be in Hindenburg's um, uh, hands. Hindenburg, um, he's already quite aged. Um, you know, he was born in 1847. Uh, before Germany even existed as a as as as, uh, as, uh, as a nation, so he is um, you know in his late eighties at, at 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 this point, um, he is elected by a very narrow margin of uh, something like three point three percent. His um, support mostly comes from the Junker class. Um, he is, of course, his full name, uh, Field Marshal. Uh, Paul von Hindenburg, so he comes from a Junker class family. He's got that pedigree, and so his power is essentially rooted in the German general staff um, as a, a former senior member, you know, commander in chief of the German army. He is very close to the German army. He's very close to the Junker classes, and he has a you know a very conservative outlook on what a German politician should be, and he is not going to be a big fan of, of, of Hitler, we'll see. Here's Hindenburg on the left side from um, the, the First World War. This decision by Hitler um, to seek power through constitutional electoral processes, of course, sets off members of his own Nazi party who are more revolutionary minded. And um, I've already um, mentioned for you Gregor Strasser and uh, Otto Strasser. Um, this is uh, uh, Gregor Strasser you're looking at. Um, Gregor Strasser is more of a socialist as opposed to a nationalist. Um, you know, the, the German Workers' Party uh, had a kind of a communistic agenda. Originally, they were planning to um, confiscate, for example, corporate property. They had a, you know, a socialist program that slowly Hitler starts uh, dismantling. But, but um, there is a, a circle of Nazis who um, begin to consolidate around um, the Strasser circle, the Strasser um, a faction, who, um, who are actually located further north in Germany, kind of in the, the northwest part of Germany, um, despite their uh, Bavarian roots. And, and they're gradually becoming rivals to, uh, to Hitler's power center. Um, they will form eventually a, a kind of dissident group um, inside the Nazi party that will become known as Group Northwest. They will begin challenging some of um, Hitler's uh, agenda. Um, among the Strasser circle, um, enemies of Hitler are Heinrich Himmler, for example. Um, Heinrich Himmler is drawn to the Nazi party, no so, not so much by Hitler as he is by the Strassers. And, and um, Himmler, in fact, ends up working as a bodyguard for Strasser 
and um, he is um, one of Strasser's secretaries as, as well as um, will be Goebbels. And, and, and so one way, for example, that Hitler is going to lure Himmler away from the Strasser circle is, of course, he'll promote um, Himmler as the head of the SS. Himmler will be very young. Like I say, he's 27 years old in 1927 when um, Hitler puts him in charge of the SS, who at that moment in time, the SS are actually part of the SA. Uh, so, uh, technically speaking, Himmler reports up to Rome, and um, the SS are kind of the more disciplined bodyguards for speakers and senior Nazi party members. The brown shirt SA are seen uh, as the, the, the um, brawlers, the thugs, the fighters. Um, while the SS, who eventually will adopt a black colored uniform, um, are, are seen as a more disciplined, hardcore body gore, um, bodyguard core, the, you know, uh, the, the Praetorian Guard, essentially. Um, they're, they're not kind of seen as, as, as street thugs or, 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 or brawlers. And, and of course, Himmler eventually, of course, becomes one of the five most powerful men in, in Nazi Germany. The other member, um, also secretary to Gregor Strasser, um, also will become a major leader in, in Nazi Germany is uh, Josef Goebbels, who is going to become um, the Minister of Enlightenment and the Reich's leader for propaganda. Uh, two posts, uh, and again, uh, we'll, we'll look at the dual structure of, of um, how you have uh, Nazi government posts, but then you have Nazi party posts, and, and the two sometimes work in parallel, sometimes conflict, but, but that'll come, come later. But uh, Goebbels is um, among um, one of the more um, higher educated uh, Nazis. He has a PhD in uh, German literature from the University of uh, Heidelberg. Um, like Hitler, he's a failed artist. Um, Goebbels uh, was a playwright and his plays never, never got produced. And, and, and so he essentially ended up working as a uh, journalist. He is a, a Russophile. He's very interested in Russian literature and Russian culture. In fact, all of um, the leadership in Group Northwest are pro-Russian, pro-communist. Um, Strasser feels that Russia is actually, because it's a rogue nation, the way Germany is in the post-Versailles era, uh, that Russia is actually the natural ally of um, uh, Germany and, and, and the, the socialist faction of the Nazi party foresaw a, a kind of alliance of German socialists and Russian uh, communists in the international sphere. And, and that's where Hitler, for example, uh, begins to challenge um, you know, the position that Group Northwest is, is taking. Um, it's Goebbels who at one point even um, suggests that perhaps Hitler should be expelled from the Nazi party. Goebbels is so locked into um, the, the, this group of, of, of uh, Group Northwest uh, uh, leaders. Um, they begin to refer to Hitler um, as the Pope, uh, meaning kind of, um, you know, the Pope is far away in, 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 in the Vatican. Um, they kind of, you know, uh, Hitler is there in Munich, but what does he know about what's happening in Berlin or what's happening in um, Nuremberg and, 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 and so forth. Um, one of the things that um, the Nazis 
introduce very early was an agenda that I had not mentioned called the 25 points. And I put a link on uh, my website to uh, the 25 points. The 25 points are, are a kind of a Nazi party platform, ranging from um, the abrogation of the Treaty of Versailles to the expulsion of the Jews and, and, and you know, 25 specific points um, that Hitler feels are sacrosanct and the 25 points um, will remain the platform of the Nazi party right till the end, right till the last month um, in 1945, except for one point that Hitler will change. And um, there was a point, if I'm not mistaken, point number seven, um, but, but, you know, don't quote me on, but there was one point where um, the Nazi party wanted to expropriate corporate property and, and Hitler, essentially declares in uh, the 1920s as he's beginning to seek corporate financing for his movement and for his campaigns, he declares that the Nazi parties are not Bolsheviks, that we have a respect for private property and that um, if we're going to nationalize any um, corporate business, it'll be things like you know, the railroad, um, the gas company, the electric company, but we're not going to be uh, nationalizing German corporations, so so don't worry. So that's the only one of the, the 25 points which were adopted in 1920, um, you know, when, when Hitler was still sharing power um, uh, with, with the old Nazis. Um, that's the only one of the 25 points that was changed. But Group Northwest now um, in 1925 uh, is beginning to challenge these uh, 25 points, as I say, to the point that Goebbels is talking about um, expelling Hitler. Goebbels himself um, is a charismatic speaker and a figure on his own. Um, uh, but uh, then on November 22nd, 1925, Hitler now calls a meeting of all the senior members of the Nazi party. And, and, and this is actually a photograph from that, that meeting, November 22nd, 1925 in Hanover in the North now. Um, and, and here you can see Strasser just sitting next to Hitler and he, he doesn't look very happy because Hitler now at this meeting begins to put down the um, rebellion. He, um, he, sorry, the meeting actually takes place February 14th, 1926. Um, Hitler now starts um, essentially putting down the rebellion. He uh, makes a four-hour speech in which Hitler, first of all, says that party policy is what the Fuhrer says is policy, no more, no less. Um, he says to define any part of his program amounts to treason um, against national socialism and against himself as the incarnation of national socialism. He says the 25 points are sacrosanct. Uh, men died for them. Uh, quote, the foundations of our religion, our ideology, to tamper with them would constitute treason to those who died believing in the idea. Um, Hitler, as again says, expropriation is wrong because the Nazi party stands for private property. And he says that the legal path to power is tactically superior to revolution. Uh, and he says as well that Bolshevism is essentially a um, Jewish conspiracy. And, and, and thus emerges that concept of Judeo Bolshevism, um, a, a, a kind of interchangeability between communism and Judaism. Um, a Jew is a communist and a communist is a Jew. It's the same thing. 
um, and, and that's going to be a very big part of the Nazi ideology um, in the coming years. And, and so Bolshevism and Judaism need to be smashed. Um, and that the Soviet Union, of course, is the enemy of um, the German people and, 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 and not their future ally. And, and, and so um, that's very disturbing, of course, to Strasser. And, uh, you know, Group Northwest is a revolutionary faction. Strasser is calling on um, the politics of catastrophe, riots, uh, strikes, um, actions to destabilize the, the, the government. That's what, what, what Strasser thinks is the best strategy towards power. And um, Hitler, of course, is, 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 is challenging um, that. Goebbels, who attends this meeting, of course, leaves us these diaries. Uh, Goebbels had, was a prolific diary and journal keeper. Um, and, and so the date of that meeting, February 14, 1926, um, Goebbels writes in his diary, um, he says, <clears throat> Strasser speaks hesitant, trembling, clumsy, good, honest Strasser. Lord, what a poor match we are for those pigs down there from Munich. I cannot say a word. I'm stunned. I can no longer wholly believe in Hitler. This is terrible. I have lost my inner support. I am only half myself. So Goebbels on that day is very disillusioned now with, 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 with Hitler. And as I say, Goebbels had proposed that Hitler be expelled from, from the Nazi party. Oh, well, um, you know, Hitler, of course, doesn't become Hitler um, without having been somehow a consummate politician or um, a manipulator. Um, and so um, Goebbels is wooed by Hitler in a private meeting. And uh, first thing that Hitler says, you know, you're such a great speaker. You're such a, uh, a wonderful um, writer and journalist. Um, I would like you, when I form the government, to be my minister of propaganda. Uh, and not only that, um, I will also make you the governor of Berlin. Uh, Gauleiter, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how the Gauleiter system works um, later down when we look at the structure of the Nazi party, but uh, there will be 40 governors in Germany, and, and Goebbels will be appointed one of them. Uh, and, and, and so once Hitler starts handing out um, you know, like you're to Himmler, you're the head of the SS. Himmler comes over into Hitler's faction, and now Goebbels will write about uh, two months after he writes about how disillusioned he was with Hitler. Now Goebbels writes in his um, diary, "We drive to Hitler. He's having his meal. He jumps to his feet. There he is." shakes my hand like an old friend and those big blue eyes like stars he's glad to see me i'm in heaven i arrive hitler is there great joy he greets me like an old friend and looks after me how i love him what a fellow he tells me stories the whole evening i could go on listening forever a small meeting he asks me to speak first then he speaks how small i am he gives me his photograph with greetings from the rhineland heil hitler i want hitler to be my friend his photograph is on my desk i could not bear it if i had to despair of this man i bow to his greatness his political genius um so you know that's pretty quick from, you know, we got to expel this guy to, um, I bow to his uh, political uh, greatness. And, and so one by one, Hitler is picking off his enemies in the Nazi party, those that he can co-opt into his own faction. He does, and, and of course, both Goebbels and Himmler are, you know, major 
power players that defect out of the Strasser circle in the Nazi party into Hitler's circle and will be well rewarded for making that early uh, choice. Goebbels, of course, will become um, Hitler's, as I say, one of his uh, you know, five powerful uh, minions or seven, you know, depending how you want to grade them. Uh, there he is with his wife Magda. Magda essentially marries Goebbels because she's in love with Hitler and, and, and she sees by marrying Goebbels he's going to become closer to, you know, she will be closer to Hitler and indeed she is. Um, Goebbels is there for all these uh, events. Um, he of course is you know, he's got a, a, a defect in his foot. We're, we're not quite sure whether it was because of a streetcar accident or whether it was a birth defect, but, you know, he has a kind of a club foot curvature. He's also very short. He's not exactly a robust member of the master race, right? And, you know, had he not been in the Nazi party, it's quite possible that Goebbels would have been a candidate for uh, medical killing, right? In fact, um, he, here he is at his desk. Um, on his uh, desk, you can see there's, there's three switches there. Right there, those three switches connect him uh, with the radio network throughout Germany. So from his desk, he can go on air and, and uh, broadcast on every radio station directly from his office throughout Germany. Um, Soviet cartoon propaganda kind of portrays him as this kind of double-faced liar. Uh, sometimes he's portrayed as a chimpanzee uh, by, by enemy cartoons. As Gauleiter or governor of Berlin, of course, he's going to end up um, being in charge of the defense of Berlin in the last day of the Third Reich. And, and of course, he administrates Berlin during the bombings, um, along with what he does as the Minister of Propaganda. Um, he's in charge of all movie productions. They have to be approved by him, um, you know, with the one exception of uh, um, uh, Leni Reifenstahl, um, the female filmmaker. And again, I'll get to her. She kind of has her own direct line to Hitler. But otherwise, um, everything produced for for um, the movie theaters goes through uh, Goebbels. So he's like the head of the German uh, movie system. He's the head of German broadcasting, overlooking newspaper publications, radio uh, broadcasts, and, 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 and so forth. And, and of course, it's Goebbels who's organizing essentially children at the end of the war um, to defend Berlin. And, and he'll remain by Hitler's side right to the end. And um, in, in, in fact, shortly before Hitler commits suicide, he takes his gold party badge and he gives it to Magda um, and, and then he commits suicide. And, and this is his last gift to Goebbels' wife for her loyalty to Hitler. Um, he is Catholic by his religion. And again, it's unclear whether he adhered to Catholicism uh, or how strictly he uh, adhered to Catholicism, Nazi leaders kind of kept that uh, private as, as again, you know, Christianity wasn't prohibited, but wasn't encouraged. So we don't know. Um, they, he is remembered as kind of a doting father, um, huge family, all these, uh, um, you know, four girls and, and, and a, a, a boy. Uh, and, and then more, um, uh, the older um, guy in, in, in the uniform is a son of Magda's by a previous marriage. Um, but all the other kids are, are Goebbels and Magda's kids. Uh, what do we have there? Uh, um, uh, six, six kids altogether. Once Hitler commits a suicide, of course, um, Goebbels and Magda cannot imagine a world for their children without a Hitler in it. Uh, and so they kill all their kids. Um, they uh, poison their, their children uh, and, and then they commit suicide themselves in this kind of Goddardama room. 
so it's it's kind of again like an ancient um, a Celtic suicide or or ancient Germanic war uh, suicide, the kind that 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 Wagner wrote about, where where a tribal chief kills all his children and all his heirs and his family, and then the last one to die is himself. He commits suicide after he kills his his children, and that's exactly what Goebbels um, does. He then, uh, he and Magda commit suicide and, and their bodies are burned, but not sufficiently enough for the Russians to, to find the entire family. And so these pictures were released uh, around 1969 by the Soviet Union. That's the first time we, we saw pictures of Goebbels um, after the fall of, of, of Berlin and the autopsy on, 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 on his family and his daughters and, and, and so forth. Next lecture, we'll start looking at how Hitler structures uh, the Nazi party in his campaign towards power and, and how it will be structured once he seizes power.